Welcome everybody um, to this session. The doors are shut, you are now ours. Um, so it's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here with Sally Spinks from IDEO. Um, I think I said this in our, we just did a Google Hangout, which was a bit of a smaller room than this. It was about the size of this coffee table, and there was us and two cameras and loads of lights and all that. Uh, so there's a few more people at this one, which is, uh, which is great. Um, but I've got a, a bit of an organizational crush on IDEO. So as a lifelong designer, a company who are really one of the best design companies in the world that take a, a really sound and, and kind of thoughtful design methodology and then really run with it and apply it to all kinds of different uh, industries and problems and, and audiences and so forth and, and just have just fantastic results with it. And uh, that's what Sally's here to speak to us about today. So uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Have you had a good day so far? Yes. Got the graveyard slot, so if you sleep, I won't notice. It'll be fine. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this session this afternoon. As Rob said, I'm Sally Spinks. You'll notice I never, ever put my name up on a slide here. I did a talk once. Somebody very helpfully spell-checked my slides, stood up to Sally Spanx. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> so anyway, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you a little about the, this process of design thinking, what it is, and then take you through how we use it with organizations, and particularly with a bit of a lens on learning as well. So let's start off by... Um, telling you who IDEO are. How many of you know who IDEO are? Uh, there's a few hands. OK. We are, as it says here, a design innovation consultancy. So we help companies design products, services, and put them out into, into the market. Been around for about 35 years. And we started off very much rooted in Silicon Valley. Did we designed the first Apple mouse, the first laptop. But actually, this process of design thinking has very much evolved for us. And we found that you could use it to design services. So the middle picture here is a, is a retail service. And then also kind of interactions, spaces, staff roles, jobs, you name it. Actually, the process of design thinking can, can help. And I think, you know, when we work in learning and development, and my background, by the way, is um, as a, a learning director before I moved to IDEO. So I come rooted in this world of, you know, I used to be head of learning design in an organization, but I don't think I really thought like a designer. Now I know design thinking, I think like a designer. And that's what I want to help you get th this afternoon. So when we're looking at working with organizations, we design holistically. So we start with the product and the service and thinking about human needs. So that's the offer and the experience. But we also connect to the brand and purpose. So what are they putting out into the world anyway? We also design business models and new businesses, new ventures. And then where I sit in terms of IDEO, we're helping to design the organization to deliver on their promises to their customers. So whether that's through new products, new services, new ventures that they're putting out in the world, often that means you've got to change that organization to be able to deliver that new service. And that's where I'm kind of firmly rooted. And that's about us helping organizations acquire this ability to use design thinking as a tool inside their organization, but also creating the conditions that will support innovation. You know how fast the world moves these days. How can we help organizations constantly evolve? But enough about that. Um, we also spread across the world, 700 people, global reach. It, it's small probably by some of your organizations, which I assume have got you know, tens of thousands of people in them. But as a design agency, it's quite large. And we work across a multitude of industries. And that's really interesting for us because we can take learnings from the uh, NGOs, for example, and plant them into um, commercial big FMCGs, or we can work with the NHS and plant those seeds into other organizations. Doesn't mean to say we copy, we use it for inspiration. So, what is design thinking? Now, this looks like a really simple diagram. Actually, 
it's quite a complex process, but it's also quite a robust process, right? And I think if I was to describe it generally, um, what we find is organizations go from having an idea, getting some inspiration, straight across here to implementation. How many of you have experienced that? It's like, oh, yeah, we know what we're going to do. We go off and do it, yeah? Yeah? Thank you. Um, what design thinking does is take us up into a new, a new realm. And up here, where it's insight and ideation, is kind of very abstract, quite intangible. And actually, it makes people feel quite uncomfortable. So inspiration is going out and doing research and getting inspired and collecting loads and loads of, of, of data and information. Actually, we then take that data and we spend a lot of time spotting patterns and spotting opportunities in that. And you don't always know where you're going to end up. So it feels quite uncomfortable. But actually, it is all part of the design thinking process. Only then, when we've kind of spent some time with, you know, almost like wet towels around your head, thinking about this and spotting those opportunities, do we go into brainstorming. And I think that's where design thinking differs, perhaps, from some of the ways that we tend to work. We tend to just come up with some ideas and then go and implement them. So we spend a lot of time in that, in that abstract space, and we can talk a little bit more about that um, later. So... Design thinking, how it works. Here are five things that we really think about. And the first is we're inspired by real people. So we don't do research in a classic way that a marketing organization might do lots of quantitative research, focus groups. We actually go and immerse ourselves in experiences. So this is one of my colleagues, Christian. We were working with a hospital trying to improve the patient experience. And he just went and checked himself in. We didn't tell the hospital. He just went and checked himself in and filmed the whole experience. Interestingly, nobody asked him why he had a camera, <laughs> which tells you one thing. But when we came back and we played this video to um, the board in this hospital, most of it was of ceiling tiles. Now, you may think... You know, we played about seven minutes of this video, and I think the board were thinking, hey, we paid this company a lot of money to do something here, and we're seeing ceiling tiles, what's going on? But actually, it was really about the experience that patient was having. There was so little human contact. You know, when you're in hospital, all you're doing is staring at the ceiling. And actually, the penny really dropped that this is what the experience is like for our patient. We need to do something about that human interaction doesn't mean to say we paint the ceiling tiles a bright colour. It's actually about what's the human interaction that's actually going to help this person. But that was through doing it from the, the uh, mind's eye of, of the person you're designing for. The other two examples I want to share with you is um, we tend to only see about six or eight people when we do research, but we go into their homes and we spend all day with them talking about their lives, what they do, um, you know, how they cope with conditions. This is um, a woman who had arthritis. And when we asked her, we were working for a drug company, when we asked her about um, taking her medication, we said, do you have any problems with your medication? She said, no, no, not at all, not at all. And we carried on talking. And then a bit later on, we said, just, just show us your daily routine. What do you do? How do you, you know, when do you take your medicine? How do you do it? And this is what she went and did. She got her medicine bottle and she went to her meat slicer and sliced the top off the bottle. When we'd asked her if she had any problems, she said no, because to her, this is a perfectly valid workaround. But to us, this is a design opportunity, right? So arthritis drugs, when you've got arthritis and you can't take the top off your drugs, right, this is something we can do something about. But if we'd have just interviewed her, we'd never have seen that. So think about research in context, and we'll come on to you know, learning and development in a minute. The one on the other side is um, a credit card, and this was a financial services company. Again, we were spending time in the home, and we said, show us, show us all your credit cards. How do you manage your money? And she said, oh, I can't. She went to the freezer and got this out. It was a Tupperware box full of ice with her credit card in the middle of it. Right? What does that tell you? 
She's trying not to use it. So a really good insight there about people need some element of control. So to her, this was her fail-safe mechanism, right? If she wanted something, she had to think about it for a couple of hours while the ice melted, right? <laughs> so that's a great design opportunity to think about, well, what service could that be? Obviously, it's not going to be ice, but what service could it be? in terms of, of a design opportunity. But it's a need that you have that you know, she couldn't articulate, but we could see from um, how she was using it. Next thing is we look outside of the category that we're working in. We try and find analogous situations to draw inspiration from. So this is a good friend of ours. He's a, an Arctic explorer. And we used him when we were doing a project designing food for an airline. Because he has very specific needs when he's going on his Arctic explorations and the way he deals with food could help us actually design for when you're eating one of those fairly weird and disgusting meals at the end of, you know, in, in, in the sky. And then this is when we were working with um, a, an emergency room in a hospital. You know, what other situations are there where people come in really quickly? You've got to do something really quick and get them out. A NASCAR race pet. And again, it's not that you want to copy things, but they might provide bits of uh, inspiration. So for this one, for example, in the hospital, the nurses were just falling over each other because all the tools were you know, along one side of the room. When they went to see this, each of those guys that's going up to the wheels there has his own cart with his own tools on it, very, very designated. And the nurses kind of prototype this as a new way of helping them think about how they can be more efficient in the emergency room. So think about analogous situations. What could you take inspiration from that might help you with your situation? Um, leveraging existing behaviors. Um, I think this is always an interesting one inside organizations. This is an example from our client-facing work around Bank of America, wanted to encourage more people to open savings accounts. And when we went and interviewed people, they all said, oh, I, I don't have enough money to save. I'll never have enough money to save. But again, we spent time looking around their house, asking them how they manage money. And when we brought all of that back, we noticed two things. One is that they all had a change jar, like most of us do, right, where we put all our dead bits of coins. And then the second thing was, and this was in the US, I don't think it happens here, but people were rounding up their utility bills so they were providing a little bit of a buffer against their next bill. So in their heads and how they'd articulated it, they weren't saving, but they were saving in micro amounts. So again, this was an opportunity for us to then design a debit card that does exactly that. So if you buy your coffee from Starbucks at $2.95, it rounds it up to $3 and siphons off the rest into a savings account. You know, and they ended up getting you know, millions and more customers but it was only doing what people were already, you know, how they were already behaving. We just took advantage of that. They hadn't articulated it. We just took advantage of it. And then the other thing that we believe is get tangible really, really quickly. And this is all about risk mitigation, I guess. How can you do something really cheaply, a minimum viable product, make it tangible, put it in front of your users so that they can tell you what's wrong with it. And particularly if you do it in a very cheap way, then people actually are very happy to rip it up and start again. If you've got a big polished item there, then people are less open with their feedback. So this is an example of working with a hotel where we literally built out the lobby of a hotel in a warehouse. IKEA furniture, foam core, everything. But not only did we test the sort of layout of a, of a hotel, we also tested out, oh, I've got the same necklace on. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, we also tested out um, the service experience too. So we got real guests to come around and help us figure out how this might work in reality. And we prototype that always with an, a, an eye to learning. This is not about piloting, i.e. we do it and then we just shove it out there. We go in with deliberate attempt to learn and, 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 and iterate. And then lastly, around design thinking, we also think we can design with lots and lots of people. 
It doesn't just have to be a small design people, uh, design team. Sorry, everybody is a designer, despite what everybody thinks, and everybody is creative. And so we've developed platforms where we can actually, we have one called Open Idea, where we can actually engage with nearly 100,000 people that come together to solve problems around deep social challenges. So we believe that going through a quite a structured process can actually lead to social change as well. So that was looking at design thinking and how we use it um, with our clients on products and services that we design. But you can actually take all of those principles and turn them in on side the, inside the organization. And I think that if you think about learning design, it's often associated with organizational change, whether it's you know, new skills you're bringing in or trying to change the culture of an organization. And we know what's the percentage here, what change programs fail? About 70%, yeah? I think that was from research from quite a long while ago, but I don't think it's got any, any better. I haven't seen anything, anything since there. About 70% of change programs fail. And we believe that because humans aren't set up to really understand logic. And when we think about designing change programs and learning interventions, you often see spreadsheets come out, right? And if we do this here, then this will change there. If we do this, then that will change there. We actually believe that humans are set up much more to understand storytelling. Logic has its place, of course it does. But actually, let's think about this in a more humanistic way, which is what design thinking does. It really gets that human need. So, you know, organizations are perfectly designed to do what they do, right? <laughs> if you get good results, you design, but actually if it's badly designed, it could all go, go a bit wrong. So our thought is, instead of organizational change and designing learning interventions for change, how about if we thought it as evolution, which is actually always just a prototype in, in waiting. We're always in beta, right? Everything is evolving. Instead of doing a change program where you go along, change, go along, and change, how about if we constantly evolve? And using design thinking is a way of actually allowing your organization to grow a bit more organically. So let's dive into that and how we, how we look at those kinds of problems. So how do we treat this organizational evolution and learning design? First principle here is how we're really passionate. Organizations all over the place develop all these principles and promises to customers, right? This is how we're gonna treat our customers. This is how we want them to be. We work with lots of organizations that want to create their customer journey, the moments that matter, all of those good things that we're gonna do for our customers. And we believe you absolutely have to align those two things. So use all of those principles Turn them inside on the organization and treat your, your people with exactly the same principles. So there's a huge connect between the customer experience and the, the employee experience. Purpose and values absolutely drives what you put out there in the world. And it absolutely drives the organizational triggers you design to get the behaviors you want to deliver on that. But if you make a disconnect between the customer experience and the employee experience, you haven't got a cat in hell's chance, really, of delivering on those behaviors. Um, we worked with a big financial services company, great customer journey, but actually the way they treated their staff was totally at odds with that. And then they were always complaining about, well, it's the call center's fault, it's the call center, it's this. Actually, the people in the call center were really good people but they weren't being treated or they, weren't, they didn't have designed for them exactly the same experience that you were trying to design for your customer. So we're, it's, we're really passionate about it. And I think this is an example of one project um, that I worked on where we've designed a new healthcare, total new healthcare system in another country other than the UK. And um, these were the customer principles that we designed. So everything we designed for the customer fell to these principles. So the first one was about leveling the playing field. So that was the patient-doctor relationship. So everything we designed, you know, including the physical space, so 
if you know if you're the patient and I'm the doctor we'd be physically uh, literally at the same level but the language I would use would also be at your level it wouldn't be technical it wouldn't be difficult um, everything we did was about ensuring we could make that relationship as, as equal as possible. But then if you turn that inside on the organisation, how does that play out inside an organisation? So levelling the playing field when we came to designing how the, the company would work manifested itself in a couple of ways. So one was um, when we drew the organisation chart, we actually took the customer journey and just plotted the people along that customer journey who would work with the customer, with the patient at that particular point. We didn't draw it as a hierarchy, right? So levelling the playing field internally is about minimising the hierarchy. When we designed any learning experiences, as far as we possibly could, unless it was completely technical, we put all of the staff in together. So whether that's doctors, nurses, administrative staff, the receptionist, whoever, Everything we did was about levelling the playing field. And then kind of treat the family became how, does, how do we get people operating as a team? So we literally turned them all inside so that when we asked them to do this to the customer, they were feeling it in their experience inside the organisation. Um, I'll just tell you about a little experiment I did around this and employee experience and the, the customer and uh, employee experience. This is, this is people at IDEO. Now, people at IDEO don't normally look like that. They don't normally wear ties. But um, I've come from outside IDEO. I've been there for about five years. And one of my frustrations is I've worked in very big organizations, and I know what cultures are like. A lot of our designers have only ever worked at IDEO or in small design agencies. And they think the world is like IDEO. You know, we get free breakfast. We, you know, we, we have a nice life. Right? We work hard, but we play hard. So as an empathy exercise, I wanted them to understand what it's like to work in some big organizations. So for the day, we locked up, the, we padlocked the fridge. We took away their free coffee. No social media, no headphones, dress smart, come in at 9 o'clock, put the leadership in an office. You have to make an appointment for them to be there. And we, we build this as an empathy day, right? to understand what it's like to work in our client organization. And I was, I was really quite shocked. By lunchtime, some of them had gone into complete rebellion and started behaving like children. People had actually walked out. There were people cutting the cable ties on the things in the kitchen. There was this notice up, which I don't know if you can read it, but it's the IDEO Designers Union, join here, which we never had. And people just throwing general wobblies. In fact, one of our experienced team was made to, to cry because people were quite nasty to her. And they knew this was about empathy. But actually, the way we treat our employees is the way we like to treat our clients. And actually, what we saw was people's attempts that all day they were just trying to get around the rules when we started to treat them differently, even though they knew we weren't trying to harm them. So I would suggest that actually, in an organization, this is... Um, a diagram that one of our founders, David Kelly, drew on a napkin in the very early days of IDEO. He wanted to work with people that were like him. And he said that when a company's eagerness to cut costs on its employee experience, when the balance is in favor in the, of the dollar or the euro, or maybe not a euro soon, who knows, um, um, is in favor of actually how you're treating people, the humanistic side of it, you can do an awful lot of damage. So it's about balancing this out and making it much more even. And I think, you know, you know, it's not that you spend everything on your employees. You do it in line with your customer experience. So for us, the reason we give people breakfast is because part of our role is to inspire our clients. So we want a talking point over breakfast where people will talk about the things they've seen the night before, the places they've been to, the exhibitions, the design stuff they've seen. It's a moment of coming together to share. So I don't think you all have to go out and give people free breakfast. It's designing a trigger that's right for you that kind of mirrors that um, customer experience. And I think maybe this is um, a point that we should pause and I should get you to think about 
Is there a principle that you have out there in the world about how you treat customers of your organization? And maybe just chat to the person that's next to you and say, how would that look if we turned that inside the organization? What kind of experience do we need to create? And then when we come back, I'll get deeper into some learning stuff. Yeah? Good? Yes? No? Don't want to do it? Too late in the afternoon? Don't care? Just join up in a pair or a three, whatever, whatever you can. So, any, any thoughts on that one? What was your, what was your, your conversation? I'll take a couple of points before I, I move on. I think there's, I'm not sure which comes first, the chicken or the egg. If you treat your staff badly, will they treat your customers badly? Or do you treat your customers badly, and that leads to you treating your staff badly? Yeah, and I, I think... We, we definitely see there's a correlation between if you're trying to treat your customers well, you've got to treat your staff well because they're the ones that are delivering it, right? It's really hard if you're saying one thing to your customer, doing something different internally and then expecting them to behave in that way. It's much easier if you treat them in the same way. They can then pass that on to the customer. Um, but you're right, it, it, it could be a bit chicken and egg, which way does it start? But our belief is if you can try and change the way your staff are, then that's also better. Yes. Am I not loud enough? <laughs> you, you oh, now I am. Um, <laughs> it's a real balancing act that you've got to not be frivolous with the money and give people, you know, perks and perks and perks. Yeah. But quite often those little perks, like the free coffee, um, actually make a big difference to asking people to stay, yeah. to retain you know, the talent and make people happy. Yeah. You're absolutely right, and I, you know that's why I wouldn't advocate anybody does what I do. The things we do, we do because they're designed, in, you know, to deliver on what our, we want our customer experience to be. So it's finding out those real moments that matter to the customer. What can you do to actually tip, you know, tip those into a real positive thing with your staff, as opposed to giving people everything. Um, and we'll, we'll come on to kind of prototyping in a minute and stuff. But you're, you're so right; it is a complete balancing act it would be so wrong to do it the other way as well, right? So we recognize that, you know, when we're in a commercial organization or even a, a, you know, a public sector, you've got those budgets to manage. So you cannot be giving everybody everything, but finding out what those right buttons are to push. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. What happens when you give them the perks and then they see it as a right? Yeah, well, I mean, probably that's what happened with my guys, right? They saw their breakfast as a, as a riot, even though they knew this was about um, uh, um, a, uh, an empathy exercise to understand how their, how their clients are. Um, and I think, uh, for me, that comes to, to prototyping and how do you, how do you start to um, uh, do small groups of testing which ones are going to be the right ones to push the right buttons rather than launching something to a whole organization and then it feeling like it's, it's right for everybody and becomes entrenched and part of it. I think if it does become a right, then you start to have to, to change those and, and move them into something else, a different experience. Um, but it's tough, right, when it becomes an absolute right. But, yeah, you can see what happened when, when, when we did that with our people they suddenly spent all day getting around the rules and weren't that productive. So, you know, we would see that as a, you know, a good way to continue our way of working, albeit they see it as a right, actually, that's okay, because it means that they're being productive. One more. I was thinking, basically, it's not just the perks you might get, but also how you're treated as Completely. a member of staff. Completely. You know, we're supposed to, I work in a hospital, we treat our patients, and we're supposed to listen to them, take note of what they want, and everything else, but it's not the same with management and staff. We're but more expected to do what we're told, and we have little input on yeah. how we actually deliver. Spot on, completely employee experience to me is not just the, the things you get, it's absolutely how you're treated. And, and if you're expecting, you know, your nurses and ever, whoever to, to perform in a certain way, in my world, you have to design to treat them in exactly the same way as you would your patient. It's so much easier for them to pass it on. And that's about redesigning that employee experience. Granted, I know it's hard, but that's 
how we would approach that kind of challenge. Okay, I'm going to move on. I've got another exercise for you later, but let's move on. So the first thing, as I say, when we're looking at organizational things is aligning those two um, processes. The next thing is to use design thinking as a process to design your organization, to design your learning and development. So the first thing is about design research, and that means getting down and dirty. So here's a few colleagues of mine, one's on an aircraft flying to New York and back again, just spending time with the stewardesses that we were actually designing for and with. But that, you know, not doing that, what is it you want? Just understanding the stresses and strains on their job, what's working for them, what isn't. And the other one on the, the right-hand side is my colleague Dave in a pea factory, spending time just seeing what's going on. Get down in that research. Spend time with people. Bring it all back into a room. This is typical of a project room that we see here. Synthesize it. Spot all of those patterns. So if it's a learning and development program that you're doing for leadership, say, go and spend time. Just hang out for a day with that person. Watch what's happening. Make those notes. Bring it back and compare it with the other 10 people you may have spent time with. What are some of the patterns that you're seeing across it? What's giving you an opportunity to design against? Then brainstorm. Um, we don't have many rules at IDEO, but we do have pretty strict rules around brainstorming. It isn't that you know, free-flowing, everybody can speak at the same time. Um, sorry, I don't know if the quality is not great on there. But actually, we do have very strict rules around how we do brainstorming, because we find that if you only have one voice at a time, people can build on top of it, sticking to the topic, deferring judgment. We've all seen this, right? Someone comes up with a brilliant idea and everybody goes, oh no, we can't do that. We tried that four years ago and that's never gonna work. Always in our brainstorms, it's about deferring judgment. And the wild ideas, the more wild they are, the better. Because sometimes in that idea, you'll find the nugget of something that will be a breakthrough for you. So have some strict brainstorm rules and these are out in the world and I can share these with you. But the thing I want to talk a lot about is prototyping. And for me, that's different to piloting. A pilot is usually something, you've designed something, you've spent ages doing it, and you're putting it out there with a small group of people to test it before you just go to launch, right? Actually, prototyping for us starts right at the beginning of the process. When we've got a germ of an idea, and we'll do something really rough and test it out. Prototype everything. So the example you can see here is um, us prototyping a training program for a doctor in this aforementioned health service that we were designing. So the guy on the left-hand side is an actual doctor that we got in, um, and the guy on the right is a, an IDO person. And we thought, you know, one of the things we want from doctors is great patient service. How are we going to train them in that? So we had this idea that an empathy exercise would be a good thing to do. So rather than sitting them down and telling them, well, here's our kind of patient principles, this is what we want you to do, they're a doctor, they're intelligent people, right? Maybe if we put them in, an, in a situation where they were experiencing what it's like to be at the hands of a doctor that maybe doesn't treat them so well. So we gave the doctor the laptop and we said, okay, your laptop's broken, you've got to do a presentation in an hour, there's the IT guy over there, go and get it fixed. So he went over to the IT guy, the IT guy, pretty classic, I think, asked him loads and loads of really technical questions that he had no, no idea of what the response was to those questions, kept accusing him of doing something with the computer, and then just sat there for a few minutes and kind of did something, asked him another technical question, didn't have any eye contact with him, slammed the computer shut and said, here you go, I've fixed it. The doctor was kind of like, oh, a bit perplexed at first. Then, penny drops, right? This is exactly how potentially patients feel when me as a doctor is dealing with them. I can talk in jargon. I can not tell them what's going on while I'm doing something. I cannot have eye contact with them. They felt viscerally how it feels 
without being in that um, you know, doctor-patient relationship. It's a different relationship, but it's empathy exercises are a great way to train people in something that's actually, you know, telling a doctor service principles is kind of, feels a bit patronizing. What we tested out with these people is to say, is this a good way of training someone? Because afterwards, we asked them to come up with some principles for how they would treat patients. And not surprisingly, they were pretty similar to a list that we'd already constructed. So prototype these things, get feedback from people, see how it's working. Um, another empathy exercise we did was working with a bike company. We wanted to train up um, lycra-clad guys, big muscly guys, all in lycra, to sell coasting bikes to people like me, who, you know, I'm never going to be the sporty person in the room. But I'm scared of going into a bike shop, right? So we made the lycra-clad guys go into a store like this and buy makeup. How intimidating is that, right? That's how people who want to buy a coasting bike felt when they were faced with Mr. Lycra-clad. So Mr. Lycra-clad could feel it and then think about what's he going to do to make that experience different. <coughs> so empathy exercises. Hold that thought in your head because I'm going to ask you to, to think about that in a minute. This is prototyping some service training. Again, we got real people in from hotels, real guests. And in that prototype space you saw built out earlier in a warehouse, we actually prototyped the training for the hotel staff and then got them to try it out on real guests. And both parties tell us how this is feeling and how we could do it better, how we could do it differently. But you'll notice this is all cheap. This is all, you know, we're not spent huge amounts of money at this stage. This is us trying out a brainstorm that we were going to do with 500 people. We got a small group of them in. Run through the exercise, do it. And I'm sure you will do this kind of thing. This is um, a prototype of a technological solution. This is literally what we would put in front of somebody as our first prototype, right? Bits of paper with scribbles on them and saying, if you had this screen and you clicked here, this is the kind of screen and we'd move another piece of paper in front of them. We are spending no money coding or doing anything until we know we've got the right thing because we're trying to minimize risk. Even this one here is built in Flinto in an app that you know, even I can make a works-like um, version of a, of, of a technical, technological interaction. Until we know we've got it right, we don't invest a penny in coding. So keep prototyping, keep iterating everything you do. Oh, and this is, um, this is a good example of what we mean by prototyping interactions. So this is a... Um, Idea has a toy lab. We designed the Sesame Street app. If you have kids, please go get the Sesame Street app. It's amazing, because if Elmo tells your kids to clean its teeth, it will, right? But this was the first prototype for this app. I'm not sure the sound's working. Sound doesn't particularly matter. But you can see the action, so... The guy's dancing on the screen. As she touches it, it does different, it, it does different movements. So she's talking through how it's going to work. And so she can turn it off at the end. The Monster Maker app. We've not spent a penny, right? <laughs> OK, this is a piece of cardboard with a guy dancing behind it. <laughs> this is really cheap, right? I would encourage you to anything you're designing, any learning intervention, be it through technology or anything, what's the cheapest minimum viable product you can take out and test with people and co-create with them? Really do it in the spirit of learning. So prototyping is super important to us. Um, this was the prototype of our... Um, our first, and I think this is also really good with technology, is we wanted to start this platform called OpenIDO to engage people around social, media, um, social problems. But we didn't know whether it would work, so we just thought, well, there's a platform out there that does a pretty good job of you know, hosting communities. Let's see if people are even interested in it. 
So we used Facebook as a way to, you know, once we got 5,000 people on board, okay, now we can now invest in what we do and build out a platform, which is the next stage of, of design thinking is about iteration. So it went from being on Facebook to on the left, OpenIDO became a platform, and now, of course, it's iterated into, into something else. So let's keep it going. Sorry? Oh, there's sound in my head now. Sound on your head. Okay. Running out of time. Celebrate failures. Yeah, always easy to say, harder to do. The story I've got here is from Spotify. Does anybody know this story? That um, they launched a new performance management system that was about... Um, they asked the staff what they wanted, and the staff all said, yeah, let's all have five tokens, and every three months we give those five tokens to people we think deserve the most bonus, and whoever gets the most tokens gets the most bonus. Tried it, staff universally hated it, right? Because everybody who's loud and out there got all the tokens, the other people didn't. They had cake and beer, right? They didn't skulk into a corner and go, oh my God, we should never have done that, wasn't it awful? They had cake and beer and said, we tried it. We did something. Yeah, it didn't work. But you know, we've learned a few principles from that, and this is what we're going to do next. So be really open about what is and isn't working. People love it when you're honest about it. Implement, which means just put it into practice. This is the, the brainstorm that we um, did with 500 people that we were prototyping earlier. Um, and then. The other thing, so that's design thinking in terms of that, but, but actually we find what's really powerful is when you teach employees how to think like a designer themselves, how to employ all of those prototyping skills. So, you know, we've never had a change program. We just continue to evolve. And you might say that's good because you're a design company. That's what you do. But actually it is about teaching people to fish, not giving them the fish. So... When we worked with the Ministry of Manpower in Singapore to redesign their employment path service, instead of training all the people in how to operate that new service, we engaged them in the co-creation process of that redesign. So actually spending time with customers, actually helping us to design both the, the physical aspects, but all the processes and all the technology that sat behind it. We didn't need to train them in terms of how they would work the new process. But what they've done since then is continue to evolve that service because they learned how to do that in the first place. So we've never kind of trained them in, in the process of the, the work path system. What we trained them through action was actually learning how to prototype and evolve a service. <coughs> I'm going fast now because I need to get through. How many minutes have I got left? You've got 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left. OK, that's all right. I want you to get you to do something. So, um, Another way of doing that is through engaging people on platforms in design thinking. So the open IDO platform I showed you earlier, you can use internally to actually create um, engagement in designing, whether that's customer service or even internal experiences. You could use this to design learning experiences as well but you're actually co-creating with, with people inside the organization. Fourth thing, humanize your communications. How many of you work in internal comms? <coughs> There's only one hand. I'm sure your internal comms are amazing. My experience, most internal comms in organizations, a bit shit, are they? What are they like in yours? <laughs> bit shit, yeah, <laughs> bit shit. Um, I, love, I love the fact it's like information technology. It's one of those things that's come to mean the complete opposite of what the words actually mean. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, talk to your people like people. Um, these are our, these are our um, values at IDEO. Um, but they're all quite... They're things I can recognise. They're things I can do. They're all actionable. But they're all pretty human words. And then we got the employees to tell their stories of what those values meant. And we got some pretty awesome videos of people. Just We just said, go away and make a video. What does embracing ambiguity mean to you? What does you know, um, prototyping mean to you? And they came back with some really awesome videos. And then that led to things like this. So we didn't ask anybody to do this, but we had talk less and do more 
as one of our things, that somebody had a baby in a studio and they produced this baby grow for a poo less, talk more, or talk less, you know, this, these were just, it just kind of grew out of the fact that we were asking them to create their own versions of what these values might be. And that's all about just language and, and making it humanistic. This is our pension booklet. Well, it's really bad, you can't see it, it's a pension booklet in the States. Um, but it's a pretty awesome redesign. It's probably the best designed pension booklet I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. But I'm not suggesting you have something like this. We're a bunch of designers, so they expect stuff like this. But actually think about how you design communications and talk to your people. And then, oh, this, is, this was a prototype of a video we did for a client talking about their purpose. We had a person on a stick that I wibbled around and then we did a voiceover over the top of it. It took us an hour to make. And we said, look, you can actually have fun with some of this stuff and make these videos. We didn't intend them to use it. We just said, look, this is a prototype. They ended up using it to all their staff to help them put across what their strategy was. You can do stuff really simply in a really engaging way and make things work. And then I think, you know, we're not perfect at the moment. We're going through what many of you are probably going through, designing our own leadership development program. And typically, we're doing that in a very ideal way. It will probably be a design challenge at some point for us to, to help them think about gathering inspiration around leadership and what is their own leadership style that they want to bring to the organization. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that we've got it all cracked, because we haven't. But I think that what we really think is that actually you can, through using design principles, actually help your organization to evolve. So I think that I'd like to say thank you, and then I'm going to get you to do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think just, um, just one more little exercise. We talked earlier about um, empathy exercises, and I want you to think about a design challenge you currently have. Pair that back to what the skills are that are really going on under that, and then think about what would be a good empathy exercise to help people identify with those, with those um, the skills that are underlying your particular problem. Is there something that would be adjacent to it. So like my, my doctor and then the IT guy. Have a think about that for two minutes. We'll take some feedback and then we'll also um, open the floor up to mm -hmm. questions as well. A few minutes for questions. Yep. Yeah. See, mine, mine doesn't ting as well as Don's. He's got a much more expensive pen than mine. Um, but uh, so we've got a few minutes now just for kind of questions um, to Sally, observations and so forth. We've got roving mics as well. So. Any questions, observations, or thoughts? I've got a, I've got a, yeah, yeah, I've got a question. I think it's more because I kind of know the answer myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, is do you create the employee experience before you can then design great customer experiences? What we comes first? Because in our organisation, we've done it the reverse, and I think we're seeing the negative impacts of that. Yeah, uh, to us it's about creating the customer experience. So what do you want to be out in the world and then designing your organization to be able to deliver on that? So we would always say start with the customer experience. And particularly if you're evolving into something else, you see lots of product companies that are now becoming service companies. Um, particularly when it's a new offer, start with that first and then design the organization to support it. Was that what you had in your head? No, I was thinking we do it the other way around. Right, because okay. I'm thinking about how you've got to engage your employees first to be able to then create that kind of culture and environment to design things for your customers. Yeah, but you it's see, so if you, it's interesting that you say. Yeah, I, I would say that you're when you're dealing with the customers, you are looking out into the world mm -hmm. and designing for those customers. So, what's the real niche thing that's going to satisfy them? Once you've established that then come back inside and design the organization to be able to deliver that new service. I think if you, if you started the other way around and engaged just your employees, you'd be designing for them. You wouldn't necessarily be designing for your customer. Thank you. Yeah, does that help? Thank you. Is there another one just there? 
Um, I was going to ask, um, I work for a large global organisation and I love the idea of prototyping, mm. um, but how do you look at doing that for multiple cultures and different yeah. across a, a global organisation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because we do obviously work with a lot of global organisations and sometimes we've helped them figure out what that negotiation is between global teams and regional teams. So. Um, worked with a big hotel chain, particularly on service um, principles and how do you train staff to do that. It's very different in Asia where staff are, you know, to a penny and you expect like 10 staff to every guest, whereas the model in Europe was, you know, half a staff to every guest or whatever it is. Um, so I think our, our aim is you, you design a red thread. What's the brand red thread that goes through this? And then you have to allow for those regional variations. But it takes a bit of negotiating back from, from global to regional to global to regional to global, rather than global setting the stage and saying, this is how it should be, and then pushing it out, and the regions going, this doesn't work for us. Or the regions inventing their own thing, but then it dilutes the global brand. So for us, it's about how do we help create the dialogue between those two? What's the common thread? So through research, we research in each market and find out what the needs are. There's always a common need yeah. in there somewhere that becomes the red thread, and then you let the le rest fluctuate. But it is really tricky. It's a good yeah. question. Yeah. Any further questions? I think that's all. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Sally. Well, Fantastic. thank you for, thank you for <laughs> playing along. Thank you. Thank you.